uh, the term assembly. Now, assemblies you were familiar to many people in this room from different backgrounds. From artists, you probably are familiar, it's a term of contemporary art. Those of you who may have professional backgrounds in biology and ecology will also know an assemblage in a very different way, in a scientific sense. The way it gets used in my field is to talk about or to define assemblage as a collection of diverse entities or diverse elements held together um, in a range of that constantly changing. And I've used this idea to look at the future of rural places all around the world in the research we've been doing. Um, and think about rural places and the countryside and localities as assemblages. So I want to suggest that we can think about the Welsh Government as an assemblage. It's certainly coming together of many diverse elements. The sheep, the start, well, we started from the, 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 the motif of this symposium, really. The farmers, the grass, the tractors, um, the... Um, the grass, etc., the grass, the, uh, the forests, uh, the streams, the moss, the red kite, the brown birds, the hikers, the mountain bikers, um, the wind turbine, the abandoned cars, the shunned photographs. All of these are elements of many more which make up the Welsh um, hill and uh, uh, uplands. And they, they're held together in these temporary contingent arrangements which are constantly changing. The uplands are different every second because the way nature changes and develops and people come in and out. And yet there's something which is viewers uh, within them. So we can adapt to change within limits, but then there are other things which threaten that. And you take one of those key components out of the uplands, or you put something new in and it affects more dramatic change. So one of the ways of thinking about how they can survive is to think about the way in which these relationships happen and what changes them. We also have a mixture of elements of Earth, some of which are material elements, they're tangible, they're doing things. They help to create the economy of the plants. They produce food, they produce other outputs, there's a tangible benefit. They are part of ecosystems which again have tangible outcomes. Others are what the, the, uh, the jargon of the left evolution calls expressive components. In other words, they're about performances. The everyday practices of living and working on the uplands, the way in which farmers walk around and travel or um, go around their fields and carry out intricate process every day. Um, I was struck, I remember at the time of the Mouth Disease um, outbreak, which was mentioned earlier, there's some interesting work done at that time which talked about the way in which the most disruptive was daily iterative practice in the farm. But what's most disturbing for farmers is often about their end, the pattern, the rhythm of their everyday life change. Now, scale that up, I think that change in the effort. We, we, get, we heard up in the house yesterday about how practices of, she of shepherds going up onto those moorlands and living the other period and working there had gone. The practice, the everyday practice of farmers are changing. Continue to change. But you take that out completely, you're losing something of the essence of that upland environment, of that loss of those everyday practices. And it's not just the people that, again, the sheep, the animals, have routine practices, and it's one of the striking things about Miranda's uh, work on the, the, the Crossing Pass project is following that path of the sheep, the way the sheep walk and the experience and how they move, their performative action, that movement of the sheep through the landscape is again part of what makes the other plants that practice. So there's something here about the, the iterative practices of um, make, a, a part of what makes the plants. The expressive components will also include the emotions which stitch together the upland community and stitch those communities to the landscape. And again, I think this has come up repeatedly in discussions of people who talk about passion and love and being mad at the sheep and various emotions which are expressed in these ways. And it comes powerfully through several of the artworks we see here and in the uh, museum, particularly in Fiam's, and again, some of Fiam's uh, work talking to um, farmers. So again, it's important of capturing these emotions and maintain them. And I think one of the things which art can do particularly effectively in this way is help to capture and convey those uh, things. We should also think about, we think about what we might be the capacity of um, 
that the humanities come again out of the close relationship, the theory and the art so passive and then that she comes to the relations between these parts. So if we think about the world chapter and what they can do, it all comes down to the components which are there, the pieces of it, how they work together. And if you start changing what you change what you can do, about the food it can produce, the economy it can support, the employment it can support, about the public goods, the ecosystem services it delivers. All of those dependent about the way they're going to be diverse elements fit together. And as we start changing that, we change what can be done. At the same time, the Welsh Uplands Assemblage are linked into broader networks. They've got a wider connectivity. They're connected into the global agri-food system. We can't escape that. Trading in markets between China buying uh, milk or cattle feed um, has an impact on the prices received by farmers who are here in Wales. Um, it's increasingly perhaps part of global energy markets when we think about the significance of renewable energy here. And certainly it is part of course of all kinds of natural ecosystems and connections. The hydrological systems which connect the water from here down through the set and the wire and the wire into the Midlands and beyond um, are to think about the way in which we are connected into a total global atmosphere and how climate change works through that. We are locked into these connections. But we're locked into connections through people as well. We've heard about the historical record, about the way in which the Cambrian Mountains have always been a place from which people come and go. And indeed, which has always produced products used across the country, around the world. Um, wool which has gone for export, lamb which is exported. Um, one of the things we've done in research recently, we followed, or we tried to follow wool from a Montgomery report to see where it went. We traced it from the farm into the collection depot in Newtown, it gets bundled together and tested, um, and then it virtually goes to a, um, a auction in Bradford where people sit behind computers and have five seconds of big and bundles of wool and gets traded there and then most of the Welsh wool is bought to be sold to China and it goes into making carpets in China, some of which may come back here uh, to Wales. But we don't know about that state because by the time it gets to that auction sold on, um, it's no longer you can no longer distinguish the Welsh wool from other wool. And once it's been bundled in the uh, distribution depot, you can't distinguish the form it comes from. We have a single um, trading system where the last monopoly system goes in the picture. Um, and that again limits opportunities of what you can do with some of this. You can compare this to some of the initiatives, say, in New Zealand, where they've managed to revive some of all. Um, cheap farming industries through making merino wool into a fashionable product uh, through grounds like iceberg and some of those products will have um, barcodes and socks that you can actually tell which form that wool has come from and some of the research I've seen there about how that's changed the relations of those farmers make them more connected because no longer they're leaving just wool to be collected by the board on a regular basis they've got customers come and visiting them, people from around the world visit their website, the conversations going on. Um, there's opportunities perhaps about to rethink some of the connections of our products being made in the Welsh Uplands and how we're able to reclaim some of that local identity as ways of facilitating added value into some of these more global systems, as well as reproducing and strengthening local systems and local markets. Um, we perhaps too need to think about um, who is local in this context, what are the people? Our Welsh Uplands have fuzzy boundaries, they are the lab, you see, you find it's the Welsh mind in a strange place around the world in different ways, and those products get carried forward, or the artwork and the representation gets carried on. <coughs> and therefore how we involve those people who are in the farming community, but other residents, long-standing visitors with strong commitments, the diaspora of people being cleared off the landscapes, and so on. So all of these are parts of thinking about the um, future. And thinking about the Welsh Uplands as there, which has a past, a present, and a future. Indeed, multiple pasts, multiple presents, multiple futures. The many diverse experiences of life in the Uplands, the many diverse visions of the future we've heard perhaps here today. And thinking about how those things combine, and work together, and which ones we should. And what then, in this landscape which is constantly changing, what is it which enables it to endure? What is it which continues the identity 
the centre plate of the Welsh uplands to uh, continue. And it seems to me that part of the answer that is thinking about what, at what point would this change, would the sense of place change, would the identity change, if we take something out? And that takes us back to thinking of things like sheep. If we take sheep out of the Welsh uplands, would they still be the same place? Or would the sense of place change? Would the way in which we think about them change, the identity of the <coughs> change? What's the degree of our restrictions? So these may not be the challenges to think about the future and the difficulty of discussions. It's interesting again to look at the, um, the answer to the first issue here. We're asking about uh, the future of the upland and the, uh, the key words which keep coming up repeatedly are diversity and balance. And I think that's positive that those are two words which from people from different views keep saying. I've got three of the post it's not here to read out, I select it, because I think they capture something of this. Uh, that reflects something I've been talking about, about the influence of an assemblage of different things. So one would say the future of the world is more diversity of work, of habitats, of wildlife, of activity, of livelihoods, of production. Or that the, the future of the world is a wider community, so a wider community able to access it, interpret it, present it, affect it, use it, benefit and the end benefit and decide and make decisions about it. What is the future of the uplands? An area with a strong sense of place, an affinity with the past and a confidence to change and develop, a positive place with positive aspirations and an understanding of our place in the national and global context. So there are other, I think, helpful fans of recognising diversity, recognising the importance of a distinctive sense of place, but also recognise the need for that to be inclusive, to be open, um, and to be connected and aware of our connections more broadly. So how perhaps do we take this um, further? How perhaps do um, we uh, move on from here? And partly I think this is a challenge in terms of um, how we think about things like policy, um, what possibilities there are for us to try to shape rural policy going forward in Wales, um, and one, how we might want to change that and shape that, but also the conversations perhaps needed at a smaller scale within communities, between stakeholders, working together to negotiate how we try to put together some of these divergent views. And again, I think art is useful in this respect, because art can help to envision and it can help to provoke. It helps us to perhaps crystallise what we want and what we don't want. And there's ways in which appealing to this art and using art can help us perform those tasks. It can be too also a way of thinking about um, feeding into that process of, of development and policy. One of the, again, the answers over here about how we bring together divergent views about talking, about listening, those are clearly represented, represented. evidence based policy making a much used phrase. But what kind of evidence? It's not just the scientific evidence some of us will bring forward. But it's also trying to capture some of that sense of a, what I meant to it was emotional attachments to the uplands. That sense of place. How do we capture that in a way we can actually use that evidence support, evidence-based policy making? Again, perhaps the scope of art to try to express that. That's the reason. I think we've seen that quite Powerfully, again, in much of the work here, in some of the films, uh, work again in some of Sean's articles, um, uh, videos, and photographs showed in, um, other, in, in, in some of the other work on this by Marion Marian, and Delphine and others in the uh, museum. So, I think those are challenges of how we can pull these things together. I want to draw to conclusion, partly by so really, I think this is a healthy starting point. And the conversations we started over the last two days can be continued, and I hope they continue in many different ways. I want to make a few of these other things just to perhaps plug three things in that uh, respect. One is a, um, a booklet which was produced by um, an expert workshop from uh, academics uh, across Wales uh, last year, but it's available on after Brexit, 10 key, quite 10 key questions of rural policy. Uh, in Wales. And this is uh, available online in English and in Welsh, 
Uh, very good question for Naomi Hans, it probably wants on, but I think it's still a way of thinking about the future and you're interested in If you Google that, uh, after Brexit, it's any questions in Wales, or the Centre for Watch Policy and Society, uh, you uh, can find a copy of that. The second thing which we will be to make is that we are hoping uh, in the next couple of months, to try and a date, uh, to have another kind of workshop session in Aberystwyth which would focus specifically on the evidence needs of rural civil society, of how we think about having an integrated rural policy going ahead and what, what do we need to support that. There's actually gaps in our knowledge to clean it up. And I know there's people here from various organisations, so if you'd like to come along to that, drop me an email and I'll make sure that you get an invitation and to that. And thirdly, if you're interested in particular the connections of art and um, thinking about morality, I've also been working uh, with the Whitechapel Gallery in London on a conference um, they have called the Rural Assembly and think about art and the rural which is happening in London and Cambridge on the 21st and 22nd um, of June um, and again if you're interested in that interconnection uh, but also it's a way that you're trying to bring rural issues to the heart of the London art world and actually um, introduce some of the art which is conveying ideas to the rural uh, uh, you can go to the Whitechapel Gallery if you're interested in about the details that. But I'm going to finish finally with um, going back to the programme um, brochure for the, the sheep um, exhibition, the sheep uh, exhibition we have in the museum. And I'm just going to quote from the entry for Sarah Bell and her um, quote here, where in her artist statement she talks about the, the art, what she does, and particularly represented in the museum, her um, her painting drawings of sheep, her black sheep, and five sheep. And she says in the quote here that there's Something about being in, the, in, being in the landscape that is reassuring and timeless. I love the sight of a flock moving slowly and eternally across a Welsh hillside scattered with half hawthorn trees. My drawings celebrate the unwavering gaze and presence. And I think it's those words which are there, timeless, eternally, unwavering presence, which are the words perhaps we need to think about how the so engagement and understanding of something like the, the watch opposite is deeply rooted and the responsibility that we have is to think about how that enduring sense of belonging and identity is continued into the future. Thank you.